Thank you, Frau Fleek, for inviting me, and thank you, the audience, for turning up to hear me. Uh, I'm, I apologize for speaking in English, um, but I'm reassured that most of you will be able to understand what I say, and I have put some, uh, some headings on the screen in order to fix the thoughts in your mind. Now, we human beings are problem-solving creatures. As I say, it's part of our nature to solve any problem that is put before us if we can. And this is, uh, the evolutionary psychologists would say, this is an adaptation of our species, which has given us an enormous advantage over the rest of the animal kingdom. But sometimes, solving a problem is the worst thing we can do. Sometimes there are problems that we should not try to solve because better solutions come from letting them be. Imagine a mother watching her child play in the garden with dirt, with dirty things, which she mixes in her hands and smears on her beautiful angel face. Um, and that the mother thinks of the diseases which her child is exposed to and of the social disaster of having such a dirty child. And she ends up forbidding the child from playing with dirt or play, putting her hands into anything except clean water. The long-term result of this is a sickly child whose immune system has not got undergone the necessary apprenticeship in in dirt, the apprenticeship of becoming used to all the bacteria and the other things, the ambient infections which our species needs to deal with. So what looks like a problem uh, from the perspective of the mother is a problem that was long ago solved by evolution, as long as we don't interfere with children playing with dirt. Another example, you imagine a student of history who really wants to understand the Hundred Years' War or the Counter-Reformation and all these huge, complex facts. And he's in the business of producing impeccable essays full of the facts that his professor needs to see. And, uh, of course, in the emergency of the present problem, he will consult the Internet. Maybe he's too sophisticated to go to Wikipedia, but nevertheless he'll go to the internet and pick up what facts he can, where he can. Uh, and this is a wonderful solution to his problem, but it creates another problem, namely that he's a, an incurably amateur historian who has got nothing in his head. He has outsourced his mem memory and lost any kind of intellectual structure to his studies. Now, that, that's, there are hundreds of examples of this kind of logic, sometimes referred to as the law of unintended consequences. Uh, that's to say, we, by solving the immediate problem, we create consequences which are a problem in themselves, but only can be understood as a problem later when they are upon us. Uh, for instance, by solving the problem of infectious disease with antibiotics, we have created antibiotic-resistant diseases. Uh, and this is a huge and growing problem which we don't know how to solve. It might be an even worse problem than the one that we did solve. Uh, in the Middle East, as you know, in recent politics, the problem of these indigenous tyrannies, people have taken it in their hands to solve them by getting rid of the tyrant, with the result that a, another tyrant comes to replace him. Okay, you solve one problem by creating another one. Uh, and uh, we know, of course, and everybody is familiar with this, of all the problems that come from the European Union regulations, which solve problem after problem and always create ten more. Very simple example, the regulations which control our rivers tell us that we must not dredge rivers because that damages the wildlife that inhabits their banks. And we in, 
in Britain obeyed these regulations. It's one of our national weaknesses that we obey instructions. Uh, most Europeans are too sophisticated to do so. Uh, uh, the result, of course, is that we, uh, um, <clears throat> we did not dredge our rivers, and last winter they were all flooded. The entire southwest of the country was flooded with enormous damage to the wildlife that we were supposed to be protecting. Uh, and that's a very simple instance. So we're, we're familiar with these instances. Uh, and the question is, uh, what do we do about it? So um, why do we solve problems is the first question. Well, we understand what is immediately before us. As soon as we, the, the, the mother watching her child play in the garden, she understands that situation. She doesn't understand, as a rule, the long-term interests of her child's organism. That is something that only the expert knows. So we always act on what is immediately before us and tend to forget the long-term. But it's not only that that's the problem. There's a, a far more important problem, which is that of responsibility. When people watch us in our lives, and we know that we're watched all the time by others, they are constantly holding us to account, saying you're doing the right thing or you're doing the wrong thing. And they judge us in terms of our immediate environment. They judge the mother who's letting her child eat some absolutely horrible uh, piece of vomit in the garden. And they say, you should not do that. That's wicked. Uh, and the mother feels judged. Right? So responsibility tends to arise here and now. Uh, and the same is the case with bureaucracies. Each office in a bureaucracy has a task assigned to it. You say, your job is to make sure that there is wildlife along the banks of the rivers. Produce the regulation required. Uh, that's all the bureaucrat has to do. He doesn't have to think of any other problem. Uh, in, in order for a bureaucracy to work, we have to disaggregate our problems into little atomic fragments. Uh, and, of course, problems do not disaggregate into atoms. They are organisms. Each problem is organically connected to a whole lot of other problems. So when we do this and give a bureaucrat a simple task to solve, he will solve it, but only by producing problems for somebody else, which he doesn't have to solve because they're not part of his remit. And, and uh, I give some examples in my own writing about the environmental problems. The, the most important problem facing environmentalists today is that problems cannot be disaggregated. They are a complex totality. Uh, and <clears throat> to put the point in another way, we are answerable for what we do or don't do, and we are answerable because we are free. Uh, and this freedom binds us to the world of doing things. We are always anxiously involved, knowing that the eyes of others are watching us. Uh, and, and so there is a maxim that everybody always has on their lips in any emergency. Don't just do something, or don't just stand there, do something. Whereas an American president, fed up with his bureaucrats, said the opposite. Don't just do something, stand there. Uh, and of course, uh, how do we learn to do that? How do we learn to do nothing? There's um, uh, an idea which is very popular, or was very popular in areas of the Middle East, that really, the best approach to problems is to renounce them, hand them over to God's will. If it is Allah's will, inshallah, which is the, you know, on the lips of every Muslim, uh, that was something which you find as a refrain, of course, in the Thousand and One Nights. Uh, and um, you might think, yes, it's rather wonderful. Doesn't that show a peaceful, uncompetitive natural way of letting the world sort itself out? Isn't that an instrument of peace between people? However, today it doesn't look like that at all. Allah's, eye, uh, Allah's hands contain nothing. Everything is snatched from them, subject 
to passionate appeals for revenge, for punishment of religious enemies, for oppression of the weak and expropriation of the successful. And our foolish attempt to do something about this um, involved uh, the attempt to Im impose upon the Middle East the institutions that embody for us a long-term perspective, institutions like democracy, nationality, and the secular rule of law. And these institutions have no place in Islam. Now, there's a real question, of course, why they don't belong in the Middle East. But if you look back over the history of the Middle East and over the Islamic conception of government, you will see that secular government, the rule of law, even democracy, are really European inventions which cannot be exported just like that and are ap apt to create more problems than they solve when we try to impose them on such a civilization. And I think we have to remember that the history of Europe is in many ways connected with our distrust of God's unaided will. Uh, the, that was what the Reformation and the Renaissance were all about, that we have been given this revelation of God's will through the Roman Catholic Church, and it hadn't led to what people wanted, which was the emancipation of the individual uh, and the new kind of institutions that individuals need. So we ceased putting our trust in God's will and started creating institutions for ourselves. That is the way we do it. Uh, and the question is, what is the ground of this practice? And, and is it something that we can still continue with? Right, so uh, there is a, an answer to this question, of course, which is that uh, <clears throat> we organize our lives according to a principle of responsibility, Verantwortung in German, which expresses perfectly what this is all about not just doing things freely, but being answerable to others for what we do. We're constantly having to reply to people's questions. You know, why are you doing that? Uh, we are in constant dialogue with friends, neighbors, and others who are judging us, asking us the question, why? Why do you do this? Why do you let your child do that? How do you justify that? And so on. And out of this has arisen our European systems of law and our institutions of representative government, whereby we try to account to each other for our shared public space. And also the whole system of excuses that we are constantly having recourse to. We, we Europeans are experts in excuses because we because we blame each other all the time for what we do. Uh, and um, sometimes these excuses are justified, sometimes they are not. But so this taking responsibility for ourselves and our actions is not just a matter of cooperating in the way that pack animals cooperate. It is a matter of living in another way uh, and another light, the light of judgment. And freedom, the freedom that we feel within ourselves and accountability towards the other, these are a single phenomenon seen from different sides. Uh, and um, this means that our way of being in the world is completely different from the way of being of animals. It's not just, as Sartre said, that we have being for others. We, are, we have a form of being in which the whole community is automatically involved. And just to be at rest and doing nothing, as Frau Flick was recommending, is to be doing something. It is to, it is to take that rest as something that we deserve, something that we won't be criticized for. And painters are very familiar with this fact. If you... Um, if you recall the kind of portraits that you see in the hall of a, a university or a, or a, a, a place where the, some a, a court of law where the old judges are still pre presented on the walls, you will see that uh, the portrait is not just a portrait of a face. There are always the hands at rest on the side of a chair or folded before the, the, the sitter. 
Uh, and the, the art of painting a portrait is an art of painting hands as well as faces and showing how those things that are constantly doing things are also sometimes at rest. And when they're at rest, the whole person, as it were, fills them in the way you fill your face uh, when you are at rest with your family. So, uh, and so that's why hands are so important in portraiture. They are symbols of the resting will. The will that rests because it is able to rest and because it is ready to account for doing nothing. Now, rest, therefore, is something we achieve by freeing ourselves from action. And it's only responsible beings like you and me who can be fully at rest. Human beings are the only things in nature that are really at rest. And rest is something they achieve by arduous struggle. Uh, and it's written on the hands and faces of all those dignified citizens who are fixed on the walls of our public buildings. So what I've just said um, is um, related to what I said earlier about the Middle East, and it suggests how we can defeat the law of, of uh, unintended, uh, unintended consequences, that there is an art of letting be. And this is vital, I think, if we are to understand the legacy of our civilization. In a bureaucracy, decisions are allocated to bureaucrats who are empowered to take them. But they are, for the most part, anonymous. And responsibility gets lost within the system. If things go wrong, no one is particularly to blame. Uh, or perhaps the institution is to blame. So uh, it is responsible. responsibility comes alive only if there is some sort of corporate responsibility for actions. And this doesn't easily occur. We know that in our legal systems, we recognize corporate responsibility. We recognize that there are uh, entities which are collective entities, like firms, businesses, uh, and universities, schools, churches as well, which have collective liabilities and take collective decisions. And they are legally liable for these things. And this is one of the great achievements of our civilization, that we created these corporations. In my lifetime, half of Europe was controlled by the Communist Party. Um, and many people in this room will not even remember those days. In my generation, this was a very important feature of our experience, to see a part of Europe in which control was exerted through the Communist Party, and there were no real corporations. All the corporations were fictions. The school was not really a school. It was just a way in which the party exercised its control over people. Uh, same was true of the orchestra, the library, uh, the dance club, and so on. These were all party, parts of the party machine. Uh, uh, there was no, in other words, there was no real liability for anything. Uh, uh, we, of course... Um, I didn't go through that experience, but I think it's a very important experience to remember because it tells us how important it is that we can hold corporations to account in just the way that we hold each other to account. The Roman law invented this idea of the corporate person, uh, and in English law we have a, another and rival idea, the idea of the trust but between them, those ideas have given us some kind of legal control over the activities of collectives. Now, we, shouldn't, we all know that these collectives can get out of control. We've been through a terrible period in the financial markets and in the international banking system where corporations have seemed to be the, the real villains in the piece. But we should never blame uh, uh, the bad examples, the, uh, the concept for the bad examples. We should remember that there are good examples too. Uh, and we should remember, in particular, the trust for charitable purposes, which is something that all we Europeans have been uh, dependent upon in one way or another through our schools, 
through our churches, through things like orchestras and so on, and through little institutions like this one. What is Convoco if it's not a trust for charitable purposes? And without things like that, your own lives will be diminished. You won't be able to amplify your lives in the way that we all need to do by joining together in collective enterprises. So um, one of the things that I need to bring to your attention, therefore, is the ha uh, habit that we all have of membership. Membership is uh, membership of an institution and identity with an institution is founded on trust. And institutions have virtues <clears throat> which individuals lack. Uh, in particular, they enable us to renounce the habit of doing things because we, they give us the opportunity of bequeathing the problem before us to the thing to which we belong. Right? When we belong to something, we could hand on our responsibilities to that thing while not losing responsibility as well. Let me take, give you an example uh, which is well known to us in, in Britain, the example of the private school. It takes decisions through its trustees, for the good of its members, past, present, and future. It embodies the experience of generations of teachers and staff. It has a place in society associated with the character of the education that it produces. And by being part of such an institution, whether as a pupil or a teacher or a trustee, you are identified with a corporate person whose reputation is bound up with yours. You can enhance that reputation or you can damage it. Uh, you can benefit from it and feel grateful for the institution that provided uh, your, your benefit. It establishes a bond of membership that in both constrains you and amplifies your social power. <clears throat> I, and um, if I want to put it in the language of German philosophy, the language that was given to us by Fichte and Hegel, the school is part of the Entäußerung of its members, of their becoming fully realized uh, as objective agents in the community to which they are destined. And that, I think, is one of the great uh, uh, benefits that is conferred upon us by institutions and why institution building is so important. Through uh, membership of an institution, you, your hyperactivity is calmed. You're brought to be in immediate relation with others who you recognize are more important than yourself. And you're sharing your problems with them. And you're also through them in relation with past and future generations. You're able to take account of the long-term point of view because you are bound to the future generations for whom this will be an immediate problem and not just a, a, a temporary problem of your own. So institution building, therefore, is a fundamental part of the, what I think of as the solution to the question of, of uh, how, how to do nothing. Uh, institutions are amplifications of the indiv individual life, and they give us this sense of being collectively responsible for the answer to a particular problem. So through membership of an institution, you can see that it might be right to ignore the present problem or simply to discuss it without a decision, as when you suppress your anger at a vindictive colleague for the sake of the school, or you refrain from dismissing the headmaster just because he was drunk at the prize-giving ceremony. Now, uh, uh, all institutional life involves a kind of amplification of the being of those involved in it so that the sphere of responsibility and freedom spreads out beyond the realm of immediate action. And this amplification of your being allows letting be to settle alongside it. Uh, and um, it, it is what institutions, of course, are, are notorious for as well. Uh, because they allow people to uh, pass on responsibilities, they can lead to complete irresponsibility. Uh, and this is what happens when institutions die. People take up comfortable positions within them, but just 
uh, allow them to proceed, as it were, mechanically down the path laid out for them without taking individual responsibility. So they die through complacency. But likewise, they live through collective responsibility. And that collective responsibility, which involves loyalty and commitment over generations, enables them uh, to be an instrument of letting things be. And this is a, a theme which I, I recognize uh, from Hegel's philosophy of right, his Rechtsphilosophie, um, in which he emphasizes that civil society, which is for him much more important than the state, is something which is composed of corporations, as he called them, composed of these institutions that we build through our own voluntary agreements in order to, uh, to spread the problems among ourselves and find solutions which are collective and not just individual. Uh, and this, I think, is fundamental to the European inheritance. It's part of our ability to deal with long-term problems that we have built our civil society from below through things like schools and churches and clubs and societies and orchestras and all the rest, all the ways in which we come together, consult with each other, and try to find a solution that we can participate in and that we can share. And that uh, building civil society from below is the real European inheritance. And I think this is one reason why the European Union has become so controversial, because it doesn't build from below, it imposes from above. Uh, and democracy can never be imposed from above. It must come from the people uh, and be built upwards towards the institutions of the state. Now, in conclusion, I, I want just to refer to um, a controversial example of what I have in mind, the Meistersinger von Nuremberg, um, <clears throat> which in, is one of the greatest works of art ever to come out of Germany. And you all know why it is controversial. It was, um, it was the only uh, one of Wagner's operas that was performed every, every year at the um, Bayreuth Festival during the Nazi period. And, of course, it was put forward then as the representation of an idealized German community, which was the real racially pure community to which the Third Reich was aiming. Okay, so it's very controversial. And as a result, if it's performed in Germany today, it's performed in an aggressive and mutilating way. Uh, usually with, uh, sometimes with the uh, singers throwing down their, their, their uh, um, costumes and coming forward and haranguing the audience and telling these uh, naive bourgeois in the stalls, stalls that they've come to the wrong place anyway. But my view is we have to grow up about this. We're not that generation. Uh, terrible things happened uh, and great works of art were mutilated, and here is a great work of art that needs to be understood in its meaning for us. Uh, uh, and so um, I don't mind that it's controversial. I think it needs to be rescued from the controversy. And the interesting thing about this great work is that its central character is not an individual. Its central character is a corporate person. That's the most extraordinary achievement. Uh, it is the, the, the body of master, master singers, the, the guild, uh, which, uh, which represents the soul of Nuremberg and it, which is in dialogue with each of its members. And that dialogue, as it were, runs through all the individuals and they all are answerable to the corporation as it is to them. And in this opera, it, it, this opera begins effectively from two irresponsible decisions made by individuals. Um, Pogner's decision to bestow his beautiful daughter's hand in marriage on whoever should win the prize song competition. Terrible thing to do to his daughter, uh, and entirely a matter of his own ego. Uh, and then Walter... Um, Walter's decision, the incoming aristocrat from outside, his decision to elope with that daughter. Again, a totally irresponsible uh, decision, 
which will separate that girl from all that she knows and all that might fulfill her uh, and take her into the wilds of the uh, aristocratic woods uh, where who knows what kind of life such a person leads. So uh, these two irresponsible decisions which threaten to destroy two lives and all the other lives around them <coughs> are brought into order by the corporate person represented through Hans Sachs, of course, uh, and through the op natural operation of music as the voice of that corporate person, the individual ambitions and competitiveness of the, uh, of the characters are absorbed. They become again one part of the long-term soul of the group and are able to see indeed that the solution to their immediate problem might be the wrong one because this immediate problem should not be solved. Uh, and the long-term solution comes out at the end uh, in the great chorus with which the work concludes, which is the solution of reincorporation of everyone into that community that was threatened with fragmentation. Uh, and a part of what made this possible, of course, is the virtue of renunciation, the re virtue of letting be, which is personified in the character of Hans Sachs. He lets this happen, that this marriage between the girl whom he deeply loves and the incomer who, who's, who is needed, not just by her, because she loves him, but also by the whole community to renew its collective voice. And this is a beautiful idea, and I think it has lessons for us today. We, we should remember that we renew things in just that way, uh, it, and through the renewal of civil society, what Hegel called Bürgerliche Gesellschaft. We build from below, uh, uh, and we build from below in this collective way by renouncing things, renouncing our individual ambitions, pooling them with the community, and allowing the voice of the community to prevail. And that, I think, is what uh, I would recommend uh, by way of, um, uh, of letting go for today. So thank you.